following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. Golenbach University, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho, and here is Peter. How are you, sir? Good morning to you, Ralph. Good morning. Yeah, generally we're uh, on evening hours, and we're trying something a little new for one day, and uh, yep. talking in the a.m., it's 10 o'clock in the morning by you and 7 in the morning by me. It is indeed. Uh, and spring training is right around the corner. Oh, uh, how nice. It's, it's arrived. Um, yeah. It's, it's nice. What spring training memories do you have as a kid when uh, in cold weather of February you'd tune in to a Yankee game on television in, from Fort Lauderdale, if I remember correctly? That's right. And you, That's exactly and right. You see the boats going going um, in the harbor behind, yep. and you're freezing to death in the northeast. In, in uh, Connecticut, yeah, that's exactly right. And and uh, it made Florida seem like a paradise, which was absolutely which was just amazing. I mean, um, this was the late '50s, the early '60s, uh, and in fact. Uh, several for several Christmas vacations, uh, we would either fly down to Florida, to uh, to Miami, to to spend Christmas vacation down there. Oh, nice. Um, stayed at the Diplomat Hotel, <laughs> where we stayed, um, and it was just it was magical. I never ever. It's always in my mind. You know, I live in St. Petersburg now, so so I I. I enjoy Florida every single day, but it was those memories of what it was like when I was a kid to come from the freezing cold of the north to come down to really what was paradise to 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 experience that to be on the beach with the with the sand and the water. I flashed on something, Peter. Yeah. During uh-huh. spring training, the Roto Rajour of the New York papers. Remember the rotor rajour, the the insert yeah. would have. They would cover the Yankees in spring training, and they would take marvelous pictures of Yogi and Elston Howard and mm-hmm. Mickey during spring training, and they'd send that up for maybe it would be this Sunday if if we're going back, and um, that was the highlight. Uh, for me, of it all, you knew it was coming, and um, there was something classy about a Yankee spring training. No, it's very true. It's absolutely true. It's it's uh, well, you know, the Yankees back then were, you know, the classiest organization of all of sports. I mean, this was back before you know pro football uh, has sort of taken over the country. Um, pro basketball and pro hockey were always sort of secondary sports and you know what the Yankees were doing and then you know at, at a certain point you know what the New York Mets were doing uh, was was incredibly important to the kids uh, growing up in the New York metropolitan area and uh, I mean the the amazing thing for me the amazing thing for me you know I, I had written Dynasty uh, where I spent uh, two years crisscrossing the country, interviewing Yankee players. Um, you know, I I ended up interviewing uh, Billy Martin in the stands of spring training where the Texas Rangers were in Florida. Um, interviewed Mickey Mantle in uh, the Yankee clubhouse. Believe it or not, they invited Mickey there, so I was in the clubhouse with him. At any rate. Um, well, so you Dynasty. mentioned Mickey. I want you to recall a story that you told me, not about Mickey, but about meeting Roger Maris through Cleet Boyer. Oh well, yeah. Well, God, we're off the topic story. of spring training, but but uh, no. no, I had I had gone to Gainesville to try to get Roger to talk to me, and Roger, who had been burned badly by the Yankee press for such a long time and ended up of course going to St. Louis where he helped the Cardinals win two pennants uh in in 66 and no, in 67 68 um 
so uh, he he really avoided the press uh, at all costs. So I I I went from there to Atlanta, where I had an appointment to meet with uh, Cleet Boyer. Uh, he had sort sort of a redneck bar outside of Atlanta, and he he said, "I'll meet you there at nine o'clock in the morning." And so I was I'm always prompt, and there I was at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, sitting at his bar, you know, drinking coffee while all around me, all these, you know, large former high school football players were sitting and drinking beer. At any rate, um, it's noon and Cleet hasn't shown up and it's three o'clock and Cleet hasn't shown up and it's six o'clock and Cleet hasn't shown up and I'm just sitting there. You know, I have lunch, I had a hamburger. Um, you know, wondering, you know, what's what's going on. Finally, somewhere around eight eight thirty, quarter to nine, uh, Cleet showed up, and he showed up with Roger Maris. So all those hours of waiting surely was absolutely worth it. And uh, it was it was it was interesting. You know, uh, Cleet sat down with Roger and me. I was sitting across the table from Roger. And Cleet said, excuse me, I've got to go take care of a few things. I'll be back in a few minutes. So I'm sitting across from Roger Maris, who was one of the you know greatest Yankees of all time. And, you know, hi, how are you? And, and Roger knew why I was there. And after, you know, four or five minutes of very uncomfortable, mostly science, silence, uh, so Roger, Roger said to me, uh, you want to go outside and talk? Um, you know, inside the bar, they were playing very loud Charlie Pride music, and it was just very, very noisy. And and I, you know, I said to myself, absolutely, that would be fabulous. And um, I had with me in my briefcase the questions that I wanted to ask Roger Maris, and we talked for a good hour and a half. And he was absolutely fabulous. He was as honest as he could be. Uh, he talked about how disappointed he was um, when in in his one of his last years with the Yankees, he had slid home and caught his hand on the cleats, I think, of either, either the catcher or the umpire and broken his hand. And the Yankees had sent Roger to get the hand x-rayed and had told Roger that his hand was fine when, in fact, he had a broken hand. And the reason they wanted him is that Ralph Houck, uh, who was... I think the general manager at the time knew that with Mickey with Mickey hurt, they needed Roger to draw fans. And then this was a, a particularly bad team. Um, and and then at the end of the season, Roger went to Hauk and told him he was going to retire. And so Hauk said to him, Roger, you know, why don't you wait until the spring and we'll throw a little ceremony for you, honoring you. And so, you know, Roger thought to himself, hell, you know, what difference does it make? Sure, okay, I'll I'll do that. And in the middle of the winter, Ralph Houck traded him to the St. Louis Cardinals, which really made poor Roger furious. Um, so I mean, these were all the things that Roger Roger talked about to me. He was just, yeah. he, he was fabulous. And then, of course, you know, after we finished, Cleet came along, and Cleet, Cleet was equally fabulous. Uh, Cleet was on his way the next day, believe it or not, to Japan, where he had signed a one-year contract with one of the Japanese teams for a million dollars, which at the time... Those you know, days, that was yeah, big that was, bucks. that was big money, big money. Yeah. Um, you know, I hadn't realized it that, you know, this was my one opportunity to talk to Cleet, and by coming to talk to Cleet, it was my one opportunity as well to talk to Roger Maris. So that was that was that was really huge. Life is really about huge. timing. Yeah, well, you also have to be incredibly lucky. And, and speaking of lucky, let me tell you, uh, after after Dynasty came out, uh, I ended up getting a job working for the Bergen Record. Uh, I started out covering the towns, and after a while, I became an editor. I ended up the the, the assistant night news editor. I was on the copy desk for a while. All this is wonderful, wonderful training. You know, I, I just so loved working on the newspapers. Um, 
and and this but, is where the luck comes in. You know, when I was interviewing Billy Martin, um, you know, I, I I wrote up what I wrote about Billy and Dynasty, and basically I said that on those Yankee teams that Billy Martin was uh, as important a figure as was Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle. And so I didn't know it, but Billy wanted to write his autobiography, and so he decided to choose as the person to write it with, you know, the guy who had said that he was as important as Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford. So he, yeah, I got a call one day. Uh, Billy was smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I got a call. Tony one day. Castro was on with 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 us a while uh-huh. back, and. Yeah clarified the DiMaggio Mickey relationship. Yes he did. Yes he did in a and wonderful way. And that was way. cool. Yeah. Um would you clarify the Maris Mickey relationship for us a little bit? Um, oh, that that's not difficult to do. Um okay. I don't know for 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 it, it was interesting. The the fans and the media saw that as a rivalry. Because if you remember in 1961, Maris and Mantle were both hitting a remarkable number of home runs in the attempt to break Babe Ruth's record of 60 home runs, which he hit in 1927. And you know, they, the two of them, and Bob Serve were living together in an apartment. They were, they were very close. Queens, friends. close to where I grew up. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you know, as the as the months went by, they were neck and neck. Uh, and then at the end, uh, Mickey had uh, caught a cold. He had sort of a sort of, sort of a fluish kind of a thing, and he went to Mel Allen's doctor. And Mel Allen gave him a shot in his behind. And Mel Allen's doctor gave him a shot. Yeah, Mel Allen's doctor gave him a shot, and and the needle wasn't sterilized, and Mickey got an infection, which was really, you know, really bad. Right. And so while Roger went on to hit 61 home runs, uh, Mickey stopped at 54. That sounds 53 about right. 54 or something like that. Or stopped at 54 because for the last couple of weeks of the season and the World Series, uh, he had this terrible infection and couldn't play. Um, and, and so there was, you know, all this this in the press about um, the rivalry between Mantle and Maris, and it was interesting because when I talked to Bob Serve about it, he said, "Oh no, they were they were very close friends." Um, and the other part of it, I thought too, that that was so interesting is that before Maris came to the Yankees in 1960, uh, Mickey was booed a lot by the fans. And that was in part because of Casey Stengel. Stengel never, ever gave Mickey his due. Uh, Stengel saw that Mickey was somebody who always needed to be pushed, or at least he felt that way. And so, you know, Casey would talk about, you know, the best player who ever played for me was Joe DiMaggio. And this was within earsight of ear, (laughs) the hearing of Mantle and 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 always, whatever Mickey did, it was never good enough for Casey. And this all ended up in the newspapers all the time. And so the fans booed Mickey because, you know, they, you know, Casey was saying he wasn't trying as hard as he could, or, you know, he would he would come to the games hungover, or you know, something like that. So, what what was interesting though is once Maris came to the Yankees in 1960, and they became in competitive. The fans really didn't like Roger because Roger was sort of an internal, quiet guy. He wasn't interested in publicity. Basically, all he wanted to be was left alone, which is not, you know, something that you should be, you know, pushing if you're a famous baseball player playing in New York. So he was he was not much interested in giving interviews or, you know, that sort of thing. And by 1960, all those fans who had been booing Mickey now were booing Maris and now were cheering Mickey. So that when in 61 the two of them were fighting it out to see who could win, you know, who could who could beat Babe Ruth's record, most of the fans were rooting for Mickey to to break the record, not 
not Roger. And so when Roger ended up doing it, there was great resentment in 1962, plus the fact that all these reporters, the question for Roger starting in spring training was, uh, can you hit 62 home runs in 62, which just made, you know, Roger furious. You know, he should have been a little <laughs> – a little less sensitive, right. but but you know he was a sensitive guy, and and he, he was he wasn't uh, well. Mantle wasn't either. Mantle was from Oklahoma, but Roger was from um, up north. Uh, not north. Yeah. Uh, um, where was Roger from? One of those states. Little that, town, um, Indiana, up up that way. And there's a little yeah. Roger Maris Museum up 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 near his hometown. But at any rate, um, it was Fargo, Fargo, North Fargo, Dakota. Fargo, that's it. Fargo, North yeah. North Dakota. That's where he came from, exactly. Um, but but Roger um, got himself in trouble in spring training in in '62. Rogers Hornsby said something nasty about him. Um, you know, a couple of the writers, even writers who were his friends, uh, Roger had sort of dismissed, and you know. And and so they were all, you know, writing stuff that wasn't really terrific about Roger. I mean, which was a shame. I mean, this guy should be Did in the Hall of Fame. Did you talk to him about his relationship with the press? Um, yeah, oh, sure. Or, of course I did. Yeah. And did he have regrets? Did he see that? that uh, no, he had no – Roger had no regrets. No. Okay. No, he had no regrets. Uh, he just wished they had been kinder to him. You know, he didn't mean anybody any harm. He was just a guy who was sort of shy. Um, you know, and, and well, I don't. Maybe that regrets is the best. Thing. What if he'd done things differently with the pre- in relationship to the press? Well, that's you know, that's that's not a question that I asked him. Would he have done anything differently? Because I don't think that he would have. I really don't. I mean, he okay. was a reactive kind of a guy. So, for instance, every single day, starting in you know July of 1961, every single day, nine reporters would ask him, "Do you think you can beat Ruth's record?" And he got sick of it. Right. He really got sick of it, and 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 the pressure on him was just enormous. By the end of uh, by the end of the season, he was losing his hair. You know, to the to the point where where Hauk had to give him a day off to you know. Go home and just you know calm down and relax. Talking and what was about amazing, the pressure. Yeah, the pressure in was the movie huge. sixty one. Uh huh. Billy Crystal portrays a guy dressed as Babe Ruth in the right field stands, and remember how uh, short that was, the, mm-hmm. right by the porch. He'd be playing right field, and this guy would come out and scream at him, dressed as Babe Ruth. Um, the pressure in New York is immense. Oh yeah, people don't realize that. Um, no, it absolutely is. I mean, what's remarkable, uh, and and you watch it over the years. You know, some of the you know very fine ball players playing for other smaller market teams come to New York, um, and 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 they don't make it. Uh, Sonny Gray, yeah. he's the latest one. You know, Sonny Gray came to the Yankees. He pitched for Oakland. Do you know there is absolutely no talk of him in the rotation? Uh, I'm lo- looking at pers- perspective, uh, you know, lineup. No, I, well, they don't. Uh, apparently, they don't need him anymore. They got they got a couple of really fine starters to take his place, and uh, my guess is at some point they're going to trade him somewhere else. Yeah. If, so if they haven't just, already, I, I, they they may well have traded him away. I don't really remember, but but they don't. I don't think they have. Okay. Uh, I would. And he's on this. No, I. They may have. You're right. I was hoping he'd come back to to the A's, Mm -hmm. where he had a modicum of success. Absolutely. The playoffs and. um, Well, the the A's the A's are putting together quite a terrific team right now. You know your A's. Yeah. I know, but they failed to sign the key to last year's success, and that was Troy Lucroy, uh, Troy Lucroy who's the catcher, and uh-huh. he stabilized that pitching staff. They let him go as a free agent. Um, now, where did he go? 
he went to the the angels, as a matter of fact. Oh, wow. So okay. Um, and also, but, Lowry yeah. went to the Mets. As a, so yeah, yeah, and Lowry just got hurt yesterday. I know, I know. That's yeah. um, part of being a Met fan. We part of being a Met fan. Yes. Report. Yes, yes, yes. Every day there's an injury report. We just don't know how it's going to be filled out yet. You have exactly. to read it out. They have an outline of it. <laughs> and they don't even call it the disabled list anymore. It's the injured list. or the That's right. That's whatever. right. Yes. So yes, they want to be politically changing. correct. Yeah. yeah. Politically correct. But I think the point that I wanted to get back to, which we're coming back full circle to Florida and how fabulous it is, um, after uh, after I got this call from Billy Martin to do his book, um, his agent said to me, you know, Billy can't do this book right now. He's got to put this off for a year. But I have another client, and his name is Sparky Lyle. Uh, he pitches for the Yankees, and he'd like to write a book. And how would you like to write a book with Sparky Lyle? So, you know, I said to him, well, you know, he's kind of a relief pitcher. Uh, why would somebody be interested in what Sparky's got to say? And so the agent, very smartly, knowing he was going to get 15% of, of the proceeds, uh, said to me, I'll tell you what, come down to Fort Lauderdale and, and meet with Sparky and you know, sit in the clubhouse and, and see what you think. And this was, what, February. And I was living in Richfield, Connecticut, and um, I went down there, and and I sat in that clubhouse, and there was Thurman Munson, and there was Reggie Jackson, and Billy Martin, of course, and Sparky, and um, you know Mickey Rivers, all the boys were there. And the boss, the and this is Hunter. right in the middle of the boss is. Oh, rain. absolutely. So there was and I thought always to myself, something going. Yeah, I, I, I said to Sparky, I said, Sparky, if you would be willing to do a diary of this season, I think we could have something really special. Uh, Sparky said, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good idea. That, that's that's fine. And so Sparky and I made an agreement to uh, to write this book. And uh, actually, I was living in Englewood at the time, Englewood, New Jersey, and Sparky was living uh, two towns over. And so the first day that I came back from spring training, I went over to Sparky's house. And um, down in spring training, Sparky had said to me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take my tape recorder with me, and I'm going to talk into the tape recorder, and, and that will be you know, some of what we use in the book. And I thought to myself, well, that's not going to work, but, you know, we'll see what happens. And so I come over to his house the first day, and Sparky says, I guess we don't have a book. I said, why is that? He says, well, I couldn't think of anything to say. So I said, Spark, I got a better idea. I got a better the idea. Let day. me ask you about what's going on. And you just, you know, you just talk to me about, you know, what's going on and what you see. He said, fine. So I, I had prepared, you know, three pages of questions about, you know, the Yankees, and and we just we just started from there, and and we made a proposal um, that we sold, and right. what I didn't realize, of course, and no real reason why I should know this, was that in 1977 Sparky had been the Cy Young Award winner uh, for his relief pitching, uh, which which helped. The Yankees into the World Series in 1977, and 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 he was fabulous. And and over the winter, Steinbrenner had gone out, not being satisfied the way Steinbrenner was, and he bought Goose Gossage. Either I think he was with the White Sox. He bought Gossage, paid him like two million dollars. Sparky was making one hundred and forty thousand dollars, something like that. And and. So Sparky, not only was he a fabulous storyteller and a very good reporter, but Sparky also was really angry about the way he had been treated. And, and if you remember the 1978 playoff game, the Bucky Dent game, 
mm-hmm. where Bucky hit that home run, his fifth home run of the season to beat the Red Sox. Um, in the ninth inning, the pitcher who Billy brought in in relief was not Sparky, who was out there warming up, but it was Gossage. And Gossage got Yastrzemski to pop out to end the game to give the, you know, to put the Yankees into the into the World Series. And so, so, you know, we're we're Sparky and I are you know going along through all of this, and he's telling me about Steinbrenner and you know really telling me the truth about Steinbrenner because nobody else, everybody else was scared to death of the guy, and so they didn't. And and he also told marvelous, wonderful, fabulous stories. Um, you know, Thurman Munson was somebody who was a very serious sort of a growly guy uh, who they loved to play you know, little tricks on. And and I know I've told this before, but it's still my favorite story where where one day uh, Thurman decided that he would, through a, a mail order catalog, he would buy a holster for one of his guns. So he fills the thing out, you know, waist 32, and he, you know, puts it in the envelope with the money. And Sparky and a couple of the other boys open the envelope and change the waist size to 55. Put it back in the envelope, <laughs> send it out. So the holster comes back. Hey, Thurman, we got the holster. The holster's here for you. And they're all standing around, and, they, and the thing, you know, obviously it's for somebody who's as big as a whale. And Thurman's yeah. just unbelievably pissed. And, you know, they, you know, puts it back in the box, you know, writes a, a nasty note. Uh, that he wanted, you know, waist size 32. And so the boys go and get this thing back, and this time they say waist size 16 and send it back out. (laughs) (laughs) The thing comes back again, and Thurman opens it up, and it's Uh, for a child. And uh, I mean, it's just, you know, this is my favorite my favorite kind of stories. These guys loved each That's other. That's why it, baseball is, is so great. These guys have so much time with um, where their imaginations can ju- just go off in the hotels, oh, yeah. the plane, the bus, oh, ro- yeah. bus back and forth. It's uh, It ends up being a family, doesn't it? it no, it uh, does, except, it, except with the Yankees. Uh, you know, we call this thing... Uh, when I finished the book, I took it. I took it to my editor, and I was going to call. I was going to call this book "As the Clubhouse Turns," which is a terrific title. You know, it was a soap opera title. Uh, "As the World Turns" was a soap opera, right, of course. And I was going to call it "As the Clubhouse Turns," because this was the season in '78 when Billy Martin and George were fighting all the time. George could not stand the fact that Billy got more attention than he got. Um, And in the end, Billy just got sick of George. And in Kansas City, in the middle of the season, he talked about uh, he and Reggie, another guy Billy couldn't stand. And he said, you know, one's a born liar and the other's convicted. Meaning oh, that Reggie uh, was a born liar. Conviction. And George Brown was convicted. Right. And he was convicted in the Watergate Watergate scandal. Um, and, and when suspended George suspended for life, is well, it's suspended fact. for life, and and then they changed the life to two years, which of course right. happened to George twice. But um, at any rate, so so it was a real sturm and drang kind of thing with George and Billy. And after Billy got fired, they brought in Bob Lemon to be the manager, and Lemon, you know, took the team to the World Championship. And it was all in there. It was all in the Bronx Zoo, um, and it was fabulous. And and I and it was funny because I said to Sparky, he he lived in Demarest, which was two towns over. Uh, I drove over when we finished the manuscript, and I said, you know, um, this is going to create quite a firestorm. So you know, please be ready. Don't don't hide when it comes out. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the thing came out ready right around the next spring training. So he was down in Florida when the thing came out. 
and he did hide for a couple of days. I mean, it was like an atomic bomb went off in New York City when this book came out, because Sparky was, was so this, honest. Was this the book that with the stir? No, that was an interview with Munson. Uh, yeah, no, Jackson. that was Sport Magazine, where where Reggie Jackson said that that he was the straw that stirred the drink, that Munson right. could only stir it bad. And uh, but we talked about that in the book. Um, when when Reggie came to the Yankees in '77, he had had an interview um, with with Sport Magazine. Um, uh, oh, my buddy Ro- uh, Robert, come on now good friend of mine anyhow this thing came out and when the other players saw it when they saw this interview with reggie jackson there wasn't one who would even talk to him for weeks you know jackson was a pariah on that team they just really hated him uh because because again jackson was one of those guys who wanted the headlines so you had jackson wanting the headlines billy wanting the headlines and george steinbrenner more than both of them wanting the headlines um, you know, George and Trump, as we talked about, two very similar people that uh, more than anything, they want to see their names in the paper every single day, uh, which both were very, very proficient at. Uh, and so so that 1978 season was really, um, wow. I mean, something was happening almost every single day, and Sparky and I recorded all of it. Um, so when the book came out, people got to see what it was like behind the scenes in the clubhouses, on the buses, on the planes, on the field uh, for their championship Yankees. And I don't know, we sold 220,000 books. It was fairly amazing. Fairly amazing. Holy yeah. And then, and then the fabulous thing, of course, is that you know the very next year, you know, Billy was ready to write his book. Uh, and I spent, you know, six months with Billy. Billy lived in New Jersey in a, in a, in a little townhouse. Um, and I thought what was interesting about Billy was that the entire time we worked, he never had a drink. Uh, apparently he was... Really? Yeah, apparently he was so, you know, upset uh, the, that he had been fired. Uh, and, and, and he sort of blamed himself for part of it because of his drinking. That the entire time... We would go to bars where we would have our conversations, but he would have he would have uh, soda water with a twist of lime, and and you know I'd drink coffee and we would we would sit and talk and you know that book became number one and uh, it was a, rem- a remarkable beginning to my career. Yes, absolutely. Um, our time is running out. This it has. Our time has run out. It has indeed. Yep. All right. Th- thank you, Peter, not just for today, for ongoing uh, being part of all this. This is well, you're very, three, you're very welcome. three years old, and um, you are a charter member of uh, <laughs> the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. You yeah. are the charter, as a matter of fact. I'm the charter. There's a well, pic- there is a picture of me taken by Tally, my partner uh-huh. and you um i was on the phone with you i was in my robe and i asked you if you'd like to do this on a regular basis you said yes i threw my arms up in the air because i knew <laughs> i was going to have a network right there good well i'm happy for you that's that's what really nice i'm happy uh to be your friend thank you peter same here all right take care ralph have all a right. great week Right. You too, and I'll talk to Mr. Reichardt. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. This is uh, the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. The show is Goldenbach University. Adios. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you for listening.